Lori has been doing <laughs> full-time uh, ministry for uh, 25 years, and uh, together they uh, d have done this marriage ministry for 10 years. They have a radio program, uh, Agape Marriage Connection, and uh, take it away, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. So anybody over 50? Yeah, this is not how you're supposed to drum up business. Oh, I thought that's why they invited us. No, no, we'll, no? Drum, we'll drum up business for Jesus. Okay. okay. Well, Jesus wants people to not have colon cancer. Uh, that, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So, yeah, we're here. Um, we are so thankful that you guys uh, invited us. I love that uh, you are doing a series on healthy homes and healthy relationships, and you've entered the... Uh, the relationship of marriage with us this morning. So uh, if you guys would open up your Bibles for us, uh, we're going to be speaking ultimately out of uh, Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 25 to 32. And if you don't have a Bible, I'm not going to turn around because I trust those guys in the booth and it's going to be up there behind me. Yes. So um, let me read uh, Ephesians 4, 25 to 32. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor for we are all members of one body. In your anger do not sin, and do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Mm. Go ahead. Our heart is for Christ-centered marriages. And one of the things that we feel so strongly about is we have to build our marriages stronger because I think a lot of the world opposes Christian marriage. A lot of the world, a lot of the church opposes marriage. They're like, why do I want to do this? We, you guys have done, the generations before us have done such a lousy job. Why would I want to step into that? And so one of the things that we feel super strongly about is you can't do it without knowing Christ. You can't do it without having a relationship with him. So we, we reference his word his spirit, and his people. You gotta be filled with his spirit, you gotta know his word, you gotta be filled with his spirit, and you gotta do it with people because you can't do this alone. We need each other to do this. Well, and when you talk about his people, um, we all have peeps, right? We all have peeps oh, in no, our- Oh no, oh no, no. Uh, just people. Not my bro no. language, okay. No, no. So we all, no. Have, we all have people that, that uh, we encounter, and when we say um, his word, his spirit, and his people, we mean people that are for your marriage, yeah. right? So yeah. there's a lot of people out there that especially society, culture, and whatnot, that are not for your marriage. And, and so when we say his word, that's God's word, his spirit, being filled with his spirit, and then his people, um, that's, that's other believers, and maybe even non-believers, but those that are for your marriage. Because the world is watching us, and one way to draw them into the church, into a relationship with Christ, is how we're living it out. And so easily for some of us that are married, this is how you live it out. If you're not married, how you live it out with other relationships, how you're living out your, your walk with Christ and letting other people see it, because they're watching. Right, and I think, you know, our, our, like Lori said earlier, our heart really is Christ-centered marriages. And and so, you know, we, we start from a, um, a base of being, being filled with Christ and being filled with his spirit. And, and when we say Christ-centered marriages, you can't really start that without having him at the center of your life, first and foremost. And our goal as Christians is to bring others to him, right? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think as our marriages are examples of how we live, lots of us with Christ go about our, our business with joy in our hearts. People can kind of sometimes see that on our faces, see it in the way we live. But they should also see it in the way we live married. Mm -hmm. They should see joy in our marriages. And, and if you don't have joy in your marriage, we need to figure out you know, why that is so. Because the world is watching our marriages today, and that is, that's going to be a witness for others to bring him, him to us. One of the things that we often say is we ask people to stand up and draw a circle around themselves. Sometimes we'll give you a tool to do that, like a piece of string. Draw a circle around yourself, and then it's your responsibility to stay in that circle. 
You can't change anybody else. You can't change your spouse. You can't change your circle of influence by what you're doing. It's let them watch and see you, but you can't tell them that. I, I like to step out of my circle, and Mike tells me that You look I at my circle a lot. Yeah. We, we, tell, we tell people, we run, a, we run a marriage seminar at our church at Lake Bible Church uh, once a year called Reengage, and, and a lot of times you'll have couples come, and um, I remember I was at a sign-up table once, and and this wife came up and said, I finally got him to come <laughs> because it was his fault that the marriage wasn't great, right? Mm. So when Lori talks about being in your circle, we tell him on the first day, all right, you're going to draw a circle around yourself and here's how you're going to make the marriage better. Yeah. Work on everybody in the circle. Yeah. That's the only way it's going to get better because I can't change her. God can change her, but I, have, I can't change her. And any of you that are married know you have really zero influence on your spouse. Mm. No, you have, you have influence. You, you have influence. influence, but you, you can control what you say, how you respond. So that's one, that's one of the big things that we talk about. The other thing is remember that you're on the same team. It's really easy to forget and think that you guys are fighting against each other about something. Remember that you're on the same team. Remember that you are fighting for the same ultimate goal. So many times we are discussing something and we literally have the exact same goal but she's not going about it my way, and I'm not going about it her way, and... That's usually the case. <laughs> that is usually the case. And, and because of that, um, we, we get into these conflicts, which, yeah. is, which is the silliest thing. The thing that we, we want people to understand, though, is we are on the same team, but God made us different. Yes, he did make us different. And there's obvious differences like our gender and, you know, longer hair, shorter hair. I think that's not a thing now. For no, guys. I don't know. Maybe no. there is. I'm not going to touch that one. But we are created very differently. And you know what? We have to embrace those differences or recognize them and appreciate them because God did plan it that way and we're supposed to be different. We're going to look at things differently. Women, we're going to look at things differently than our husbands. Husbands are going to look at different things differently than you. You use the example a lot of times of, you know, they, men compartmentalize stuff. They put things in a box and I sometimes am all over the place. How I got here doesn't matter where I started here, but it, in my mind, it all relates and it all goes together. And sometimes Mike will walk in the door at the end of the day and I'm like, okay, Mike, this is happening. And he's looking at me like, what are you talking about? Where, how did you get there? You know, and so then when I go back through my trail, that usually makes no sense to him. You know, I saw a man walking with his dog on the side of the road and suddenly I was over here. We have trouble in our marriage. You know, the house is on fire. <laughs> That's so, right. You know, anyway. we, we, men and women, we do have different brains and I, I always hate well, I always say I hate generalizations, but actually, to tell you the truth, I actually love generalizations <laughs> because generalizations actually are generalizations because a lot of times they're true, right? True. So when she talks about men's mind being different than women's mind, if you think about food, I saw you guys have a nice spread of food out there. I didn't see if there was any waffles or spaghetti, but those are my two food groups we're going to talk about. So men, men's, men's brains are more like waffles, right? So they're, they're square. They have little compartments in each one where I can pour lots of syrup in. And if I take one square of the waffle, all the other squares are perfectly fine, right? They're not, nothing's affected. Lori's brain is much like spaghetti. Mm -hmm. And it's not right or wrong, but it's way different. And, and when, when she takes some, some spaghetti, it's so intertwined that everything is like coming out all, mm -hmm. at, all at once. Mm -hmm. And because of those two things, our brains aren't thinking right. But again, God made us that way, and it's biblical. Yep. And in fact, there's four, there's four times throughout Scripture that it tells us how we were designed and created differently. So um, the first two are in Genesis. So Genesis 1.27, very early in the Word. God created mankind in his own image, male and female, he created them. And then in Genesis 5, 2, he created them male and female and blessed them and named them mankind. Then Jesus repeats that back in Matthew and again in Mark, where he says, at the beginning, the creator made them male and female, both in Matthew and Mark, Jesus says that. And the one thing we know about the Bible is when the Bible is trying to get us to figure something out, trying to get us to know a point, it is... It tells us over and over. Four times in the Bible, he says to us, which should be obvious, right? He says to us, you're created differently. You're created male, you're created female. And as beautiful as that is, that's what causes a lot of conflicts in our marriage, mm -hmm, I think, mm -hmm. sometimes. And so when we learn to embrace that instead of fighting that, it can change the, a lot of the ways that we look at things. Um, quite a few years ago, our oldest daughter got married, and she wanted to have her dad dance with her at her wedding. So we started taking dance lessons because I, Mike has two left feet. He's left-handed and he has two left feet. It's the weirdest thing. So um, we decided to take dance lessons. And we really enjoyed the dance lessons. But what we saw in these lessons is that there's a lot of biblical principles in what we were learning in dance. First of all, I was a little, 
I was, I was kind of um, brought up Baptist, so I was a little bit afraid to go to dance, or at least even tell anybody I was going to dance. <laughs> Thank you, yes. But basically, if um, you, you know that Baptists are against premarital sex, right? But the reason they're against premarital sex is because it can lead to dancing. <laughs> Okay. So, so we did go to these dance lessons, but I'd wear masks and all sorts of things. <laughs> he did to kind not. Of... No, no. But we learned a lot of things. We did learn a lot of things. And one of the biggest things, one of the biggest lessons with our dance is, well, first of all, it was really fun to learn that together, and then be able to see my husband hand that off to our daughter, dance with her, and then hand her off in marriage. And it, it was a neat thing. But what we learned is we had to have a leader and a follower, and. I, have, I can honestly say that Mike has been, for 36 years of our marriage, he's been the spiritual leader of our home. However, I didn't let him lead everything. I let him lead what I wanted him to lead and what I allowed him to lead. And then suddenly that came all to, you know, in the light when we were taking dance lessons because every time he would try to lead something, I would, like, try to preset it. You know, I'd try to help him along, help him lead. And what, what ended up happening is usually, you know, he'd be going sore left toes. and I'd be going right. And yeah, sore toes. <laughs> That's it's for true. sure. It's true. I mean, they're, they're got, again, the, people get mixed up with this leader follower thing uh, in marriage. God created us both equal, right? We're exactly equal. I can't dance without her. She can't dance without me. We are equal in, the, in, in that, that manner. We're equal in marriage. But he did set us up with different roles, right? Mm -hmm. And my role in dancing and really in the home is, is to lead. And when, when she tries to usurp that role, she does end up with, usually it's her because she has open-toed shoes usually, ends up with the worst, worst of it. So, um, so th there was a reason for us to be in different roles within, within this dancing. The other thing that we learned is that you can't really do it alone. We, we, Number one, you needed somebody to teach you. Mm -hmm. And number two, you needed some instruction. Well, in marriage, we have instruction and we have the word of God. And when we say his, his word, we're talking about the word of God. He gives us instruction throughout this book. And, and, and so um, that is, that's, that's kind of where we get our lessons from. But we also need him to demonstrate for us, just like we needed a dance teacher to demonstrate for us. Right. I love YouTube. I love watching YouTube videos or whatever. And I kept thinking that we could do that. We could, you know, we don't have to go to lessons this week. We could just watch a YouTube video. And there's a couple different kinds of YouTube videos. There's the ones where um, it shows another couple dancing. And then there, my favorite ones are the ones where there's like feet prints and you have to learn to follow the footprints. And that's a lot like walking with our, our walk with Christ. We have to watch sometimes others do it better than us. Someone that knows it, that knows God's word. That's when we say, you know, we want you to do God's word, do marriage with his people. We need, we need pastors like Pastor Ron, who is, preaches the word, who tells you the truth. We need someone that goes, has gone before us and is doing this. In marriage, absolutely the same thing. And the videos were good too. I'm watching someone else exemplify it also really a good thing. So it's really important that we, that we do have someone that we are surrounding our circle. So the whole point here is that, that we, God created us differently, he created us male and female, and as beautiful as that is, we as human beings kind of screw that up, yeah, right? We, do. um, we don't recognize our differences. We don't recognize our different roles. Um, many, time, many times, Lori kind of wants me to be a mind reader. I'm supposed to know what she's thinking before um, I, I do it. And wait, wait, what's the problem with that? I, I, I it's don't true. <laughs> but, but then we guys do the same sort of thing. We, we, we just go full bore without kind of bringing our wives along. And, and so we need to recognize that in marriage there are differences, but they're God-given differences, and we, need, and we really need to embrace that. Yeah. And women, when we talk about men being mind readers, we all do it. We all do it. We want everyone not just our husbands, if you're in here and you're not married and you're in a relationship with someone else or maybe you're just completely single and in just a friendship, we expect everyone else to understand what we're thinking, why we're thinking it, where we're going with it, why, how we got there. And that's why it's really important to recognize our differences, our different roles, our different capacities as men and women and how God created us differently. And, and I, love, I love the differences. Another thing that we often do is we set them up, our spouses up, with our expectations. We have really high expectations of something and we set them up to fall into that pattern. And it, it's really not fair if we haven't really explained that or articulated that well. Part of this problem, I think, is because we're in this culture and we're in this kind of, I call it kind of a Facebook culture, but um, culture, s social media, society kind of tells us what our marriages are to be mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. And we seem to be following that 
rather than following this too often. Yeah. And, and, and when we do that, when we follow society's norms of marriage, that's when we've kind of gotten into a mess and we won't bring others to Christ because we're doing it society's way instead of God's way. Well, we know, we know, we know the internet. We know Facebook. We know social media well. We know all 27 pictures that this family took to make sure that they all look perfect and their house is perfect and their vacations are perfect. But the reality is they're not perfect. We don't need to know all of the stuff that's going on, on Facebook. We need to know God's word. Because of that, because we're in society like that, we have these unmet expectations, and that leads to conflict it also does. in marriage. It really does. We expect our spouse to be more of something or less of something, and, and, and that can cause a lot of uh, distress. So that all leads to conflicts in the homes, and we're all about here in, 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 at Portland Community Church about healthy relationships and healthy homes. So um, we need to embrace the differences rather, rather than um, use them as, as sources of conflict. And, and Paul tells us in, in Romans how to do that. In, in Romans 2, he says... No, 12, 2. I'm sorry. In Romans 12, 2, thank you. He says, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. And what I really love is, I love different translations of God's word because sometimes it brings a little clarity where there wasn't one. And I, this one, I'm going to read it from the message because I love how when we see how this is broken down a little bit more in the message, how we can apply it. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you in the best Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out, readily recognize what he wants from you, and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, deserves, develops well-formed maturity in you. So uh, moving into the passage we, uh, we started at the beginning, um, people ask us, we, we, we've come up against, when people ask us what we do kind of outside of work and whatnot, when we say we have a marriage ministry, you'll get a lot of people say, well, what is a marriage ministry? And, and our pat answer is we just teach people how to be married, right? Yeah. So we certainly don't have this down. Don't think that, oh, they're like the gurus of marriage. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not. We, but, but we have some observations. We, we, we believe strongly that Christ needs to be in marriages, and, and so that's kind of what we're out there preaching. So um, Ephesians 4, 25 to 32 comes in the second half of, of Ephesians, and any of you that know about Ephesians, uh, Paul was writing this letter to Ephesians in the first three chapters, talks about kind of our per, why we have a position with, with Christ, why we have, have the, um, the, the power that we have through Christ. But in the last four Chapter, uh, last three chapters of, of Ephesians, he talks about the nuts and bolts of how to do that mm -hmm. and how to live that way and how to live united. Mm -hmm. And so this typically isn't considered a marriage passage. Ephesians 5, 21 through 33 would be a marriage passage where it talks about wives and husbands and how we're supposed to live with each other. But this really is a marriage passage because it's telling us how to live as united believers, how, yep. how to live united together. Yep. So we're going to break down some of those passages that Mike read earlier, and we're going to start with um, chapter 4, verse 25. And it simply says, I'm going to just head it off at the pass, don't lie. Quit lying. Since you put away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. So we have to just stop lying. And it's very easy to think that I'm not a liar. I tell the truth all of the time. But what about those little white lies? I, I think that's such a weird word, white lies or a fib. It's just a little lie. There's no difference in lies. A lie is a lie. I had to really recognize that. I struggle with that a lot because I just would want to kind of mold what I was saying so I could defend myself or my spending or something like, like that. Like when you go to Nordstrom's and you have a bunch of new things and say, look how much I saved. Yeah, well, <laughs> but that's not a lie. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. But, um, but it, 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 I think it's even deeper than that. I, I think when in a marriage partnership, I think it means we have to have complete honesty and we have to have mutual respect with each other. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, we need to speak well of our spouse and to our spouse, whether it's face to face or whether we're talking about them some at work or some someplace else. Right. And I think we need to remove the words always and never from our conflicts, right? Like you always are late home from the office or you never 
take out the trash. Those are things, those are a lie because the truth is they probably don't always do something or never do something. And when we use words like that, when we exaggerate our speech like that, it, it shows them that we don't really have respect for how they're hearing us. And so we have to recognize it seems like it's not a big deal, but take those words out because we want to have a mutual respect for each other and let them respect what you're saying and believe what you're saying. Right. So moving on to uh, verse 26. Paul says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity or in some translations, do not give the devil a foothold. Um, do not sin in anger is what we call this. But, but interestingly, it starts off be angry, right? Yeah. It doesn't say never be angry, mm -hmm. right? So there, there's, there's not a command to not get angry, but we're called to not sin in our anger. And there, there is a place for righteous reasons to be angry. Those don't happen often. Uh, and they have to do with um, anger over things that go against God's holiness. Well, and we should get angry. There are things that we should get angry. I mean, you say it doesn't happen often, but I think sometimes it does in our everyday lives. When I see what's going on sometimes out in, the, out in school or what society is telling our children they can believe, that makes me mad. That is, and I think that's a righteous anger because God would not desire that for our children, for our families. So we can be, we can be angry, but we can't stay there. We can't linger in it. Because, and especially what this verse is saying is don't sin in that anger. And when we linger in it, when we stay there, that causes us to sin in it. I think um, the other part that we have kind of lived out um, through our 36 years, and honestly, I, I don't think we really consciously did this. It, it has happened, but now we consciously do it because the next part of this verse says, don't let the sun go down on your anger, right? So, so we, we have been up at three in the morning. We've been up at four in the morning trying to resolve an issue because we just don't want the sun to go down on our anger. We, we can't go to bed. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd like to say it's because we're so, we're so in the word and in the Lord. It's mostly because I can't sleep. <laughs> um, but but we, we literally, we, ha we will hammer things out all night long uh, before we actually go to sleep. And what we're not saying is you have to have a resolution or you have to have come to an agreement before you go to bed. We're not even saying you can't go to bed when you're mad, but you just don't want to stay there. What I think of is so often if we've had like a really tough thing and the next morning Mike leaves for work, I mean, it's already kind of scary when he's on the road anyways. And so when he's driving to work and he's mad and he's mad at me, that causes, that does cause sin. I, I can be the cause of that by not trying to come up with something that we could at least agree to to deal with it later or something. I think the other thing that, that it means is, like you said earlier, don't wallow in it or don't let it linger because the, the last part of that is, is don't give the devil a foothold, don't mm -hmm. give the devil an opportunity. I think when, 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 we're, when we're mad at work or mad at home or whatever, other things besides your spouse will become more attractive. Mm -hmm. Other people will become more attractive. And, and mm -hmm. so you need, to, you need to kind of get rid of that angry get rid of that anger and, and, um, and not let the sun go down on it. Yeah. So the next one that we have is don't steal. Now, it's really easy to think, again, like, like the lying or whatever. I, I don't steal anything. I've never stolen a thing in my life. But we are, what are things that we can steal in our marriages? We can steal time from our spouse. We can steal time from our family. Yeah. It's, I, I honestly, when I was thinking about this, I thought, well, I'll probably skip this verse because I'm not really a thief, mm -mm, right? No. So, because in some, some translations it says thieves, the thief must no longer steal, right? Instead, he must do honest work with his own hands that, so that he has someone, something to share with anyone in need. But we do, we steal time from each other. What, if I work extra late when, for no apparent reason or I got to get this thing done, when really I should be home, I'm stealing time away from my family. I'm stealing time away from my spouse. If, I'm, um, if we go to dinner, and um, I situate myself at Outback Steakhouse so the, um, the Mariner game is on up above Lori's head, I'm stealing conversation and I'm, I'm, I'm stealing attention away mm -hmm. from her. Mm -hmm. And I think it's okay to apply all of these things, the stealing, the lying, all of that to these other things because I don't know how many times I've seen couples that are sitting at a dinner table somewhere or at a restaurant, both of them with their iPads up, you know, re maybe reading or watching a movie and they're sitting there together but they're not doing it together. That is stealing, that is stealing 
a piece of their heart because you're, you, you're not spending the time getting to know each other and talking to each other. We put our phones in front of our face everywhere we go. I, I don't know how many times I have seen a whole entire family, ours included, with all of our phones out. Now, in our defense, it's like, oh, we're all looking something up. But the next thing you know, we're looking something up, and then we go to Instagram, and then we go to, well, I do want to see what this, this email said. And so we're sitting there like that. That's stealing time. That's stealing the ability to grow emotionally with our spouses and our loved ones. Lori likes to talk about not stealing intimacy from, from um, each other. And, and I think it's a really valid point. When, when we share something uh, at work, we share something with a girlfriend, we share something with whoever, that, that's really kind of close to our heart. That, that's stealing something away from her if I do that. That's stealing away intimacy from her, where she and I could be having that conversation rather than me with somebody else at, You know, at I recently had a woman share with me, we were talking about the dancing, and, and she shared with me that, that her husband got very involved with just some other teachers that were teaching him to dance. And it was that he was sharing parts of his life with these teachers instead of with his spouse. And I think that's not uncommon. We have to really protect that. We have to protect the things that we're talking about to us other people about our about our relationship about anything because that that place is Mike's my stories are Mike's and his are mine we need to keep that tied in I think that we shouldn't be sharing things outside of our marriage the end of this verse Paul talks about working with your own hands mm -hmm. so that you have something to share for anyone in need and I would argue that that anyone in need is your families right mm -hmm. and so we should be working to cultivate that spending time with our families, spending right. attention with our families, and spending activities with our families. We should not be stealing those ways. We should be working to do that yeah. together. Yeah. And the last two that we're going to come up against is speak kindly and give grace. And this one is really near and dear to my heart. I am definitely a woman of words, and I, words affect me. Words, the way they're said, the gestures maybe that are said. Mike is Italian, and so he's a little loud sometimes. And sometimes, literally, when he's asking what we're having for dinner, it sounds like I'm getting yelled at. What are we having for dinner? I don't know. Why are you yelling? You know. So it's because it, I'm hungry. <laughs> but but we have to think of that. Speaking kindly doesn't entail yelling. Or and and I'm not I'm not justifying it because he's Italian, he gets to get away with it. But we sometimes can have these tones. I mean, I know women, we're really good at it. Rolling our eyes or being just kind of like, yeah, whatever. You know, it's, it's very easy to do. And so that isn't speaking kindly. It says in the verse, no foul language is to come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need. So think about that just for a minute. When you're rolling your eyes, is that good for someone that's in need? Your spouse has been gone all day, maybe. Husband or wife, it doesn't really matter. And, and then when you come back together, and your, your attitude towards them is just kind of like, yeah, whatever. It, it, that, that isn't kindly, and that isn't building them up at all. No, not at all. And, and, and I, I love, you know, it, it, this one says no foul language. That, that's kind of easy. I, I'm not really a cussing type person, um, so I don't do that. But I do have the tone. I do have the eye rolling. I mean, we, we need to, to kind of be aware of how that is. Lori's very good at kind of pointing that out, and she points it out in a gentle fashion which has kind of helped me in, in the long run um, be good at it for these last two years of our marriage. And, and, the, and the last part of that verse, past, um, verse 30 says, and don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him. What does that mean? What that means is God, it hurts God's heart when he sees couples interacting badly, when he sees us not speaking kindly to each other. And it's what I talked about, or what you said, one of us, at the very beginning of this, people are watching. People are watching our marriages. This is how we're going to draw them in to to a relationship with Christ or into the church is by living out a Christ-centered marriage. And so that is why it's really important to not, don't grieve the Holy Spirit by the way you're talking. Well, I love that example because we all, um, those of us that have children, we know how our heart hurts when we see that our kids have made a bad mm. choice. Um, or those of you that, that don't have kids but are kids of somebody, I can tell you your parents think their heart hurts when, mm -hmm. when you make a bad choice. And, and that's what don't grieve the Holy Spirit means. We're, we're grieving God's spirit when, when we make those choices, when, when we speak that way that's not wholesome and really uplifting, good for building someone up. I, I love this verse as a marriage verse that is, is no foul language to come to your, out of your mouth, but only what is good for building someone up in need. Before you start any argument, Think about what the positive solution to this is going to be, mm. and that will help build your, your wife up. And then Paul gives us some solutions. He gives us three attributes that we can really use 
and how we can apply these so we can be more like Christ and so we can be that example. And one of them is he said, be kind. You know, and, and grace, being gracious and being kind are really at the center of that. Be, just be kind, be nice to each other, just talk nicely. Before he tells us to be kind, he tells us to throw away all of our kind of inherent bad humanity. That's and that is, that is the bitterness, the anger, the wrath, the shouting, the slander, the brawling, the malice. It's kind of sad that he has to delineate all of those, mm -hmm. but I think he does because we, that, that's inherent in us, mm -hmm. and we have to make a conscious effort to get rid of those and then turn around and be kind. Yeah. And grace really is at the heart of kindness. Yeah. Grace, if we're willing to wipe the slate clean like Christ did for us, um, that is, that's the ultimate show of kindness. It is. And sometimes just a compromise can be showing a kindness. Be of one mind. Be on the same team. You're not, you're not always going to agree on everything. That's, that's a given. I mean, I'm not telling you something that you don't know. But be willing to compromise because there's a, there's a gentleness in that when you don't always have to stand firm on this is my way and this is how it has to be. The so, other thing he says is to be compassionate. Mm. We're to be kind, we're to be compassionate. Some translations will say tenderness, show tenderness. And I love that because I think um, when we show a true tenderness to our spouse, we are showing our ability to feel what they feel. We're able to weep with them when they hurt. That, that's, a, that's a compassion that we need to have towards our uh, spouses and towards our children, towards our families absolutely. really, is to have that compassionate heart, that, that, that tender-heartedness and courteousness. And the very last one is to be forgiving. And Christ is really at the heart of forgiveness. Christ forgave us for so much. Why, why can we not try to step into that zone? We need to be forgiving. We need to have a forgiving heart. So, um, so to, to kind of cut, bring us to a close, expecting kind of some sudden big changes in your spouse isn't really going to happen. Mm -mm. Um, these things are much like our walk with Christ. They are a, a gradual thing, but if we're continually looking to where we need to be looking and looking at our hearts, that is going to happen. But, but, but it's not going to happen on your own. Mm -hmm. we, we can't do any of this without Christ at the center of our lives and the center of our relationships. And in and, 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 um, uh, 1 Peter 3.8, it's a great way to kind of start and have the mentality we need to have to, to start some of these changes in ourselves because that's going to be the only way your marriage is going to get better. And Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3, 8, finally, all of you be of one mind, mm -hmm. be of one mind, having compassion. There's that word again, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous. Mm -hmm. And I think by practicing these principles, you can be dancing with your spouse. You can be. And so when we put Christ at the center of our marriage, and again, I'm not telling you something you don't know. I, I, I believe I've listened to many of Pastor Ron's sermons online, and I believe that you are hearing God's word. So this isn't stuff that you don't know, but, but sometimes we have to be reminded to put it into practice. We have to be reminded to live it out and, and remember to put Christ at the center of our marriages, not ourselves, not our feelings, not our emotions. But Before you can do that, you have to have a relationship with him. And so if some are out there without a relationship with Christ, I would encourage you to explore what that means. Um, Pastor Ron, Micah, anybody's available uh, to help you with that decision. But before you can have a Christ-centered marriage, you have to have a Christ-centered life. Mm -hmm. And we're all about Christ-centered marriages, but we understand you have to have a Christ-centered life. So we thank you for allowing us, allowing us to share our hearts with you today and, and know that um, the marriages here at uh, Portland Community Church if following um, Christ's example, will continue to draw more to him. Mm. So if you don't mind, let us close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I, uh, I thank you for this opportunity to share this morning, Lord, and I thank you especially for your word. I thank you for um, uh, the, the Apostle Paul and, and the way that he can so uh, easily delineate for us how we need to behave and how we need to behave as Christians and subsequently as uh, husbands and wives. And Lord, I would, I would pray for all the hearts here that uh, you may have spoken to uh, some or if, if not all of them and that um, you through your word, your spirit and your people will work in this, in this body to uh, bring many closer to you and bring those from the outside in closer to you as well. Amen. Well, we've invited uh, Mike and Lori back uh, to give a marriage seminar on August 19th. Uh, it'll be a Sunday night, 4.30 to 7. They'll come and they'll give a presentation, then we'll have a dinner, and then they'll give a second presentation. Would you guys just tell us a little bit about what you're going to talk about? 
Well, you're the woman of words. Do you want to? You go. No, uh, we're, we're going to talk about communication because whenever people come to us and say, you know, if, if they're having problems, we'll kind of ask, so what's the issue? Well, we just don't talk. And my, my first statement is that's perfect. That's the beginning of communication if you're not talking. Because one of the things we try to drive home is that we need to learn how to listen before we talk. And so we are going to talk about communication. Yep, and this can apply if you're not married yet, if you're thinking about getting married, if you're single. Communication is, can be difficult in all relationships. We all have a circle of influence, like we said. We all have someone that's watching us, listening to us. And so we can all learn to communicate better and have Christ at the center of all relationships. So it's not just for the married people. But we'll be talking about, we'll be talking about communication primarily. Yep. Have a few little exercises. Right. We'll look forward to that. Thank you. Let's Thank give them you. a hand.